Come in, mother. I see you, Mary, are not give you my message. What? Mrs. Radcliffe intends to take Anne home this evening. Well, my letter failed to mention that little detail. Oh, heavens, that means she must be on the train as we speak. Oh, dear. Of course I'm worried. I'm worried about how she is to be cared for at that estate. Please ask Anne to see me as soon as possible. Perhaps she can put my mind at ease. Anne, we better telegraph her older brother in Essex. He might be able to shed some light on the matter. See if you can locate his ex exact address. Thank you, dear. Oh. Well, I must say, I, I admire Mrs. Radcliffe's determination. She's had to go for herself, and she's going after it in all due haste. I imagine this single-mindedness is helping her to uh, deal with the grief of losing her husband. Nonetheless, I must convince her that Normansfield is the best place for Anne. She mentioned in her letter that she would be unable to make further payments for Anne's continued residency. Knowing Mr. Radcliffe's reputation in the business world, I assume this is due to her preference and not a reflection of her financial situation. Shame. We built Normansfield for the Radcliffe's of the world as an institution for the feeble-minded of the higher classes. For Earlsworth, as vital as it is to the care for the mentally afflicted, was always meant to function as a charity, and thankfully so. But as more and more well-to-do families sought our care, that they couldn't be admitted for fear that pain patients would soon outnumber subsidized ones. And that went against the hospital state admission. So I decided it was time to tender my resignation in order for us to locate a hospital to operate on our own. And within a year, Norman's Field was purchased and our first residence admitted. Oh, among them was our very own Mary Arnott. She was eight, Mary was 18 at the time that she arrived. In fact, I remember the day she came to Norman's Field. She clutched the hand of her pretty little doll and continually tried to comfort the thing as if it were the child who was moving away from home. Oh, her doll. Oh, that's right. It's here somewhere. She calls it Madeline. <laughs> oh, she brought it with her yesterday when she came to my office. Uh, she comes every day to tell me what day it is, in case I forget. One of her daily rituals, which started ever so long ago, one that I look forward to just as much as she does. Oh, there, there you are, Madeline, playing a bit of hide and seek. Well, I found you, so no more games. <laughs> oh, listen to me, chastising the doll. It's exactly what Mary used to do when she first arrived at Norman's Field, conferring any of her own bad behavior onto Madeline. Funny, I. Right? Never realized how much you look like, Mary. In fact, if you were a real child, I'd say you have the same form of idiocy as she. In my seminal paper, The Ethnic Classification of Idiots, uh, published 20 years ago, back in my Earlswood days, I was the first to give this type of idiocy its own designation, and I called it Mongolism. Uh, due to the way that the physical features of the typical patient resemble those of the Mongolian people. It occurs in roughly 10% of all the feeble-minded cases presented to me. Notice, the face is flat and broad, with eyes obliquely placed, and the lips are large with uh, transverse fissures. The skin has a slight dirty yellowish tinge and is deficient in elasticity. The hair is not as black as in the real Mongol, but brownish color, uh, straight and scanty. 
the Mongolian patient is always congenitally based and never the result of an accident after uterine life. The circulation is feeble, so however much advance intellectually is made in the summer, some retrogression um, may be expected in the winter. That paper was quite influential in the medical field, and the term Mongolian idiot has become widely used, though oftentimes to my dismay. My ethnic classification of the feeble-minded was simply a way to categorize disabilities by common physical attributes of those afflicted. Unfortunately, there's a trend these days to use any form of medical study to substantiate the claim that there is a genetic hierarchy among the races. And it's no surprise that some of my colleagues have decided that our own kind, namely European Caucasians, make the top of the list. I assumed and my paper made it clear that since Asian features may appear in Caucasian families, that there is no credence that the ethnic lines are blurred, and there's no credence to this claim of a genetic hierarchy. Oh, I should have listened to Mrs. Dow, who beseeched me to take proper credit for the designation and forego the Mongolian term and go with something along the lines of uh, Down's anomaly or Down syndrome or such. Huh. But I wouldn't hear of it. That paper was published only months after Lillian's death. And my newfound path of humility would not allow such self-recognition. All right, Madeline. I think it's time that you are reunited with your rightful guardian. Oh, that must be Anne. Come in. Oh, Anne. So nice of you to come. Uh, here, come in and please take a seat. I wanted to extend my condolences to you and your family for the terrible loss you've suffered. Uh, yes, I know your stepmother is on her way here to take you home, which is why I wanted to speak to you. You don't want to go? Oh, no, calm down and please tell me why. I'm touched that you feel this way toward Mrs. Down and myself, and the feeling is mutual, I'm sure, but what about your home? You spend excessive time alone in your room, that's not unusual. Oh, wait, the door is locked from the outside? Restraints? Is that why you complained of your wrists hurting? No, that's not the way one should be treated at all. And with your permission, I would like to inform your brother of this. Very well, I will plan to telegraph him right away. Oh, I'm very sorry that you were treated this way. I promise you this, Anne, that I will do everything in my power to make sure this type of treatment is put to an end. Now, I must discuss Ah, uh, with Mrs. Down, preparations before your stepmother arrived. Oh, there, there, child. Please, don't be afraid. Why don't we get one of the nurses? Perhaps the two of you can return Madeline to Mary, who I'm sure is missing her terribly. Don't worry about a thing, Anne. It's all going to be all right. Nearly tea time, and no Mrs. Radcliffe as of yet. No reply telegram from the brother. And no relief for poor, distressed Anne. Though I know the staff is doing their utmost to keep her occupied and comforted. And all I can do is wait. 
drinking my tea, feeling so distracted. I don't know how I'm to give a lecture tonight. Oh, thankfully, Mrs. Down did most of the talking for our two o'clock tour of Norman's Hill with the Winslows. A delightful family, all in all. Though Mrs. Winslow tends to be a bit long-winded, yet my patience is running especially thin out of concern for Anne's welfare. What we ought to do is hide her away when her stepmother arrives. Of course, that's out of the question. But I know the perfect spot in our on-site theatre. Underneath is a basement used for the indoor children's play area. Hardly anyone knows about it that isn't part of the family. And Anne would love to be so close to the theatre. Oh, she does so enjoy performing. Which is another reason she should remain here. Where else could individuals like Anne have the opportunity to express themselves through the arts on such a beautiful stage as our very own Normansfield Theatre. Oh, I must tell you how enthralled with the place the Winslows were. Oh, while well, I was lost in my thoughts, Mrs. Down spent a good 20 minutes going over the ins and outs of the theatre and how we incorporate its use into the rehabilitation and education of all of our pupils. Uh, besides having regular Sunday services for all to attend, we have a long-standing tradition of Thursday night talent shows wherein every pupil and staff member may participate. Even our sons have gotten into the act. Oh, Everley had this wonderful bit where he would impersonate an admiral of the Royal Navy and the way he would salute... Oh... <laughs> It's something I'll never forget. I, I, Mrs. Radcliffe's train should have arrived by now. I better check with Mrs. Dow. Mother! Oh, Mother dear, are you there? Oh, hello, Mother. Any word on Mrs. Radcliffe? Well, she's with Anne now. Why did you not notify me the moment she arrived? Never mind. Please ask her to see me as soon as she is done with Anne. It's imperative that I speak to her. Any idea what I should say? Uh, no, I, I don't imagine that asking her to let Anne stay for the annual school trip to the coast will have much sway. Now, if it were a trip abroad, no, 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 no. Uh, don't worry about a thing. I'll think of something. Yes, please let her know I'll be waiting. Thank you, dear. I wish I hadn't said that word. Abroad. It brings up some bad memories. Oh, I have nothing against traveling to foreign locales, which can be an illuminating experience. But it's all a question about timing, isn't it? Tragically, that was our downfall, Mrs. Down and myself, when we travelled to Paris three and a half years ago. Bad timing, indeed. An alternate meaning of the word abroad is to miss the mark in error, which is exactly how I felt, not to be here at home at the precise moment when we were needed most. Of course, we had no way of knowing such a thing when we started our journey. We left Brighton early, Mrs. Down, Percival and I, to board the morning train to London. Oh, Re Everley and Reginald were content to remain here at Normansfield and busy themselves in the workshop or to go fishing. But Percy, on the other hand, was delighted with the prospect of spending a few days in London with his school chum and his family. We left him in good hands, and Mrs. Down and I proceeded on to board the uh, boat train to Paris. We arrived at the Hotel Bellevue that evening without incident. But as I was signing the register, Mrs. Down opened a telegram for us, which I assumed was a welcoming message from our Parisian friends. Oh, the sound of her crying out, followed by uncontrollable sobbing, led me to think 
Mother was having an attack of some sort. She later said she wished it was so. The dreadful news was that Everleigh was dead. Bled to death from an accidental injury in the workshop. We returned home on the first available boat, but which wasn't until the next morning. Ugh, what a horrible night we had to endure. Of course, neither of us slept a wink. With no means of communication back home, all we had were questions for each other. Mrs. Down would ask, how could this happen? And I'd say, oh, I don't know, dear. How could the doctors not save him? I wish I knew. What are we doing in Paris when our son has just died in Norman's field? Why, indeed. Scientifically, nightmares are fascinating visual conjectures of the subconscious. Personally, my nightmares began right after that night, and one in particular continues to haunt my sleep from time to time. It always begins the same way. I'm walking downstairs in the dead of night. I feel consumed with an intense dread that I'm forgetting something extremely important. But then I hear something emanating from the dining room. As I enter, I see Everly lying on top of the table with a white sheet covering him like a blanket. He's alive, but the sheet is stained with blood over his upper thigh. My son, how did this happen? He sits up and looks at me and simply shrugs his shoulders with no sign of pain. He then proceeds to uh, expose the wound by moving the sheet. I can't see it at first because his hand is covering the, the spot. As I step closer to inspect, I see that he's actually holding on to something. A chisel that has been thrust into his leg. I realize it's the same chisel that Reggie uses in the workshop. Did Reggie do this? He simply looks back at me with not answering. And then he tries to pull the chisel out and I scream, no, Everleigh, leave it be, I'll mend it. But he tugs at it anyway and it comes out in gushes of blood. We just look at each other. Doing all is lost. That's when I wake up. Or I should say regain consciousness, for in all honesty, I'm not fully awakened in spirit since that dreaded telegram to Paris. At the inquest, the jury returned a verdict of accidental death, even after the testimony of our senior carpenter who was there when the boys began fighting in the workshop where one thing led to another. We all decided it was the best for Reginald, the only 17 at the time, not to be held responsible for his brother's death. As it is, I am sure it will weigh upon him for the rest of his life. I could offer no words of comfort for poor Reggie. In fact, I didn't speak to him for nearly a year. I, it was easy enough to avoid him. I think he avoided me as well. I simply buried myself in my work for the next two weeks until he went back to school. What could I possibly say to him? It's all right. Accidents happen? Mother tried to intervene, but to no avail. It wasn't until the following summer that I finally decided it was time to address the issue. Upon Reggie's return from school, I sat him down in a chair 
and I started by telling him about my recurring nightmare. Now, Reggie, I've told you this because I think I figured something out. It's about that awful dread I feel at the start of the dream, like I'm forgetting something or missed an appointment. I always assumed it was for not being here when the accident happened, or oh, my resulting guilt of being abroad. But it wasn't that at all. I now realize what I had forgotten was to be your father. You have been through a horrible ordeal, and I did nothing to help you find your way through it. Mostly because I was trying to find my way as well. Mother has been most attentive, courageous actually, dealing with her own grief while tending to yours and mine. But it was one of my patients who helped me see the light. A young man named David, he, he's one of our congenital mongoloids uh, that rely greatly on the daily routine. <laughs> Quite affectionate toward his mother, so much so that without fail, he writes her a letter every day. Unfortunately, last spring, she passed away, but he continues the ritual and every day writes her another letter. The only difference is the address now reads, Dearest Mother, who resides in heaven. David's devotion to his mother is remarkable and further evidence that what matters most is our relationships with the ones we love. I've lost two children in my lifetime. No matter what has happened, I can't lose another. Especially not from my own neglect. Mother informs me that you will intend to apply for a medical trainee position at the London Hospital. I'm pleased to hear it. I can empathize with your desire to devote your future to saving lives. Good man. May your rights undo any wrongs. Now. What do you say we take a stroll to the boathouse and take a skiff out for a row? Oh dear. That must be Mrs. Radcliffe. Oh, I haven't prepared. I'm not ready. Come in. Oh, George, thank heavens it's only you. Oh, please, I didn't mean to offend. I uh, simply thought you were someone else. What do you have there? Oh, the finished photograph of Walter. Well, I do appreciate you delivering it personally. Thank you, George. Now, let's see what we have here. Ah. Well, isn't that peculiar? All around the frame of the photograph, it seems to be blurred. I wonder how that could have happened. Funny thing about the photographic process is how intrinsically similar it is to the creation of human beings. Like the development of the human embryo, imperfections may surface in a photograph due to any number of variables in the process of developing it. A thousand things can go wrong and uh, oftentimes does whether it's the improper mix of chemicals, or a sun glare, a double image, or even blurriness. The end result may be viewed as defective and sadly cast aside, or as an intriguing, if not awe-inspiring quality to what's been created. Much in the way that we should view peculiarities in the human body and mind, for I believe we are all created in the image of God. Although some may seem to be blurred at the edges. Shall we just cast them aside? No, I hope not. 
for that which is different. Need not be shunned. Oh, dear. that definitely will be Mrs. Radcliffe. Oh, let's see. Oh, her return train will be departing shortly. I will need to be convincing in an efficient and timely manner. We shall see. Come in. Ah, Mrs. Radcliffe, thank you for seeing me. Uh, let me say at the onset how sorry Mrs. Down and I are to learn of Mr. Radcliffe's passing. He, he was a well-respected businessman, and uh, I enjoyed our occasional conversations on international trade, which I know he was a man of some influence. <laughs> Dr. Down. My time here is very limited. Perhaps we should move on with it? Oh, of course, forgive me, please. Have a seat. And I can appreciate how limited your time is, but I know how concerned you must be for Anne's welfare. And I feel there are a couple of matters which need to be discussed. If I may, I'd like to get right to the heart of the matter. In my present situation, I can't afford the fee to keep Anne here at Normansfield. Simple as that. Therefore, I have no choice but to bring her home. Madam, even though Anne's progress uh, has been quite evident, which you yourself noted in your letter, to be whisked away from her training prematurely could have negative ramifications. I strongly advise that she remain here at Normansfield to continue her education. And I am a firm believer of uh, learning by doing. Oh, I can assure you, Anne will be kept busy with duties in the kitchen and around the house. Uh, when not otherwise occupied, uh, she will be uh, kept safe. Oh, kept safe. Oh, I beg your pardon, but if keeping her safe uh, means locking her up in her room, that's hardly in Anne's best interest, and not the type of life we envision for our patients. Neither is forced labour. Am I not speaking to the revered Dr. Down, whose philosophy for the idiot child is to teach them to be a productive member of the community? Did you not train Anne in your workshops? Uh, in do daily household chores, or was her fee for naught? Mrs. Radcliffe, um, did your husband not make provisions in his will for Anne's care? Mr. Radcliffe was quite conservative in his view on inheritance, and has allowed his estate to be solely passed on to Anne's brother, Harold who it now seems is to be my lord and master. Not an enviable situation to be in, don't you agree? As for his, his plans for Anne, I've not been informed of any, but I await answers upon the completion of the probate process, which could take some time. Well then, my dear madam, would it not be prudent to let Anne stay here until the situation is more apparent? And in circles we go, Dr. Down, for as I have just stated, I can't afford Anne's fee to stay here any longer. Well, if it's a matter of finances, uh, I'm sure Mrs. Down could place a temporary hold on her account until the probate is finalized. Uh, if you would just put yourself in Anne's shoes, I'm sure you would see that what she needs... Are you suggesting that I have something in common with an imbecile and uh, presume to know what it needs? Well, I didn't mean to offend. My point is that if we take the time to get to know the feeble-minded, we'll see how similar they are to you and me. We all have something inside us that could be described as a disability. It need not be a physical impairment or a mental disorder. It could be a personality defect. Uh, say, my overconfidence in my ability that borders on vanity. Or, your seemingly lack of compassion for a poor soul who needs your help. Well, 
I find your comments to be exceedingly frank. Madam, please remain seated, or do I need to get some restraints? Huh. Maybe then you would understand what Anne goes through when you use them to lock her up in her room. Did she tell you this? And you believed her? I would be able to tell if Anne were making up stories. It takes an advanced mind like yours to lie convincingly. How dare you? I have a good mind to file a formal complaint. <laughs> Saved by the door. I excuse me. Come in. Oh, Mrs. Down. Oh, no, a, a most welcome intrusion, I can assure you. A telegram from Errol Bradcliffe? Oh, excellent. Thank you, dear. Madam, I do believe this could be important to our discussion, with your permission. From Harold Radcliffe, Essex, to Dr. John Langdon down Normansfield. Thank you for all the condolences and for your concern for Anne's welfare. Rest assured that my father did discuss Anne's future care with me before his passing, and has named me as my sister's legal guardian. Per my father's instructions, Anne will remain at Normansfield until such time that you feel in your expert opinion she may come live with me and my wife. Please inform Mrs. Radcliffe. I will take over all fees for her care. We look forward to visiting Anne in the near future. Sincerely, Harold Radcliffe. Well, I am certainly glad that arrived in time. Oh, I, I took the liberty of telegram, uh, sending uh, Harold a telegram this morning, asking for clarification on who may be responsible for Anne's care. And now I know. Oh, I am so sorry that you wasted a trip out here. And if it weren't so late, I would offer you a tour of the facility, but I know you have a train to catch. And don't worry about the thing. Um, Mrs. Down will put the account in Harold's name immediately and will inform Anne of the change in plans. I think uh, an extra helping of pudding tonight should abate any disappointment she feels for not going home with you. <laughs> Safe journey. Disaster averted. Oh, oh mother. No, I should tell it in person. Oh, I feel like celebrating. <laughs> oh, but I do have some notes before I need to leave for my lecture tonight. But I'm too excited to sit still. I'll write on the train. Oh, I hope it's not the same train. It no, can't be. <laughs> but I must see Mrs. Down before I depart. Though, one thought more before I go. It continues, evermore, the work of rescuing from oblivion and neglect a class of people who appeal to our tenderest sympathies and our most affectionate regards.